Let me begin today's lecture by asking you a question. You have to answer it for me. Are you optimistic about the future or pessimistic about the future? If you're pessimistic about the future, raise your hands. If you're optimistic about the future, raise your hands. OK. So as I expected, I saw more hands go up with respect to pessimism than I did with respect to optimism, although it was about 60-40. Uh, that's quite uh, good in my opinion. If I ask the same question in many other parts of the world, in many other countries, from people who are your age, I'll get a similar breakdown. In fact, I might even get a more pessimistic breakdown than I got from all of you. Generally speaking, it's been noted that people are, relatively speaking, quite pessimistic about the future, especially these days. If I narrowed down the question and asked you, are you optimistic about Pakistan? Raise your hands. Honestly, if you're pessimistic, you feel that uh, nah, things are not going in the right direction, raise your hands. Honestly, it's okay. Right, so now the, the breakdown is about 80, 20 percent. You know, this, is, this has been observed across countries uh, that generally speaking, people are much more pessimistic today than they used to be in the past. And people also look at the past more positively. They think the past was much, much better. The future is much, much worse and is going to get much, much worse. There's, the climate problem, there's so many other problems, etc. I was going through this book, um, it's a wonderful book by Steven Pinker. It's called Enlightenment Now, and he's written several books. And he gives a lot of data about what's been happening in the world for the last 200, 300 odd years, or even, even, even further than that. Uh, you know, sort of even longer timelines of data. He looks at healthcare, he looks at, looks at wealth creation, he looks at happiness index, quality of life, knowledge, equal rights, women's rights, science, reason, etc. Just flipping into his book. And he shows you that in fact, while people have been becoming more and more pessimistic about the world, perception of the world is becoming more and more pessimistic. In fact, the numbers are exactly the opposite. The world is a much better place today than it was in the past, even though the perception of the world today is much more negative than it was in the past. Something similar is going on with respect to Pakistan. Perhaps you, know, you are less pessimistic about the world and much more pessimistic about Pakistan, as could be seen by the fact that when I asked the second question, nearly 80% people said they were pessimistic about Pakistan. But what does the data show? Does it show what Steven Pinker has demonstrated about the world, or does it show something different? That's going to be our question. In layman's terms, we have, do, do you know who this person is over here? This is Lord Mountbatten, right? The last viceroy of uh, India. And my question uh, for the class today is, perhaps we were better off under the British. How many of you think, yeah, maybe we were better off under the British? OK, that's a surprise uh, for me. But uh, consider, to begin with, let me make the other case. Consider, for instance, that um, when the British were here, they laid the foundation of the railway system of India. And this is one of the largest railway networks in the world. And most of the railway stations that we have in Pakistan, as well as in India, really were created at that particular point in time. It linked up the entire country. These are the good things the British did. That wonderful picture is the picture of the Lahore, Lahore Railway Station in 1880. Just look at how clean the streets are and how beautiful the railway station looks. Has anybody been to the Lahore Railway Station recently? So yes, and can you really honestly say that you know we are better off today than we were? Look at that. Uh, picture and tell me we are better off today than we were at that time. Here's another example of uh, uh, the British building Indian railways. Uh, you know, this is sort of, uh, as you can see, a raised railway platform. And here's a quotation by Marx. Marx says that I know that the English millocracy, that's a, a play on words from, you know, owning a mill, intends, uh, intend to endow India with railways with the exclusive view of extracting at diminished expenses the cotton and other raw materials for their manufacturers. But when you have once introduced machinery into the locomotion of a country which possesses iron and coals, you are unable to withhold it from its fabrication. You cannot maintain a network of railways over an immense country without introducing all those industrial processes necessary to meet the immediate and current wants of railway locomotion, and out of which they must grow the application of machinery to those branches of industries not immediately connected with railways. The railway system will therefore become in India 
truly the forerunner of modern industry. Now, he wrote this over 150 years ago, and it's turned out to be true. The railways really became the forerunner of the introduction of an industrial society in India, introduced by the British. They built schools. They built colleges. This is the government college uh, of Lahore, right? Beautiful picture. Um, it used to be one of the premier institutes. They built modern courts. This is the Lahore High Court. Uh, a really, really old picture, as you can see. There are no walls at all, if you notice. There are no high walls. You go to the Lahore Court, how high the wall is. You can't see any of the beautiful architecture anymore because it's all hidden behind a wall. And anyway, the architecture itself has become now, uh, you know, it's been changed so many times that it doesn't look as beautiful as it does in this, in this picture. They built the modern army, a modern army. The Indian army, as well as the Pakistan army, is basically nothing other than a colonial institute. It operates its ranks, its discipline, its culture, its ethos. Everything has been created by the British. Nobody can deny it, right? Uh, the armies that existed before the British came into India were of a very different kind. They were the Mughal armies. But those were not modern armies. Those were, those, those were more like medieval armies. So a modern disciplined army. They introduced medicine and vaccination. For example, uh, vaccination against smallpox, etc. Uh, they passed the Compulsory Vac Vaccination Act in 1892 to prevent for smallpox. They set up sanitary commissioners, etc., etc., dispensaries, hospitals. Some of the major hospitals and teaching hospitals and universities, medical institutions, have been set up by the British. For example, King Edward Medical College. Now, we always call it, you know, KE Medical College, or we say King Edward without really thinking of who we are talking about. King Edward is the king of England, right? And it's in his name that this medical college has been set up. They undertook social reforms. For example, they banned sati, uh, child marriage, untouchability, etc., etc. Cruel and inhumane punishments and practices, etc. Uh, widow, uh, you know, they allowed widows to remarry, which was not allowed in, in, um, in Hinduism, etc. They set up beautiful museums, like this is the Lahore Museum, set up by the British. It was set up in 1865. This was not the original location. There was another location, and then they moved it in 1894 here. And this is Pakistan's, arguably, this is Pakistan's best museum, right? It's the most visited museum. They set up population censuses. Uh, so you can see here's a Pakistani <coughs> census worker. He's going with uh, someone with the, from the military, and also there's somebody from the police accompanying him. And all of this began in 1871. We wouldn't have all the statistical data that we have today were it not for the fact that the British came and set up all of these uh, uh, organizations to, to, to look at um, uh, India and Pakistan. Well, at that time, United India. They began to survey India. They created, uh, you know, all the major maps of India were created really by the British. And they're used even today. Uh, surprising to think that uh, although we've lived in this part of the world for thousands of years, we didn't cre really create too many maps of India as a whole. It was the British that created them. Um, and then what did we do with all of the stuff? Well, we created institutions like EXACT, which uh, offer fake diplomas for cash. Um, so have we really moved forward from the time of the British, times of the British? What's your opinion? Weren't we better off under the British? Didn't I give you enough <coughs> examples to prove my point? Yes. All right, wonderful, wonderful feedback. So let's look at the data, shall we? Over here, we look at our, mention the years. We start from 1500, and we go all the way up to 2001. This is a beautiful, fantastic data set put together by Madison, right? Here we have the United Kingdom, all of Western Europe, nearly all of Western Europe. Uh, United States, China, India, and all of Asia, excluding Japan. In the 1500s, the UK had 1.1% of the GDP of the world, percentage of total world, right? And India had nearly a quarter, and China had nearly a quarter. Yani India and China together produced half of all the things that were produced in the world, whereas uh, uh, all of Europe produced less than 18%.
of all the things that were produced in the world. And the United States was producing only 0.3%. This is back in the 16th century, at the beginning of the 16th century. Then we move to the 17th century. It remains largely the same. Uh, a little decline here, but for India and China, it's largely the same. We move to the 1820s, and we suddenly see a big drop in the percentage that India is producing. China, in fact, increases suddenly, uh, uh, but then both begin to decline. We go from 24 to 12 percent. China goes from 25 to 17 percent. Decline further, 7.5 percent. Further decline, 4.2 percent. Further decline, 3.1 percent. So by the time we became independent, let's say around the 1950s, we had gone, India as a whole, had gone from producing one quarter of the world's commodities to producing less than 5%, only about 4% of the world's commodities. And what happened to the United Kingdom? It went from producing 1.1 to its high point of producing 9% of the world's commodities and then began to decline again. What happened to China? It went from a quarter to producing, much like India, only around less than 5%, and now is suddenly on a rise, especially after 1973, producing 12%. Still recovering, but not quite there yet. The United States goes from 0.3% all the way up to nearly 20, above 20%, uh, uh, you know, one fifth of the world's GDP. Europe producing nearly 20%, a quarter, uh, up to 33% of the world's GDP. So, what's happened in the last 400 odd years, 400, 500 odd years, is a complete <coughs> reversal in the way in which the world has operated and worked for thousands of years. Asia, which did nearly India and China together, which produced half the world's commodities, went from producing half to producing less than 10% together, now are producing what is about 17%. And Europe, which produced a small uh, minority, went from producing that to producing about half, a complete reversal between Europe and Asia. Similarly, when we look at the 19th century on its own, we can see similar figures. Here are the figures of rate of growth per capita, uh, uh, rate of growth of GDP per capita. So this is something that you brought up. You said that we've been doing better since we became independent. Let's look at the facts, okay? So in 1820, between 1820 and 1870, India grew at 0.00% rate of growth. There is no growth for those 50 years. From 1870 to 1930, the growth rate is 0.54% for all of India. If any politician stands in front of you and says, I gave you 0.5% rate of growth, you would probably say, get out of office. Imran Khan has dipped below 3% rate of growth to what is it, 2.5 or whatever it is right now. And the whole country is saying, you know, we don't want any more Tadili. 1913 to 1950, it goes to minus 0.22%. And then immediately after independence, 1.4%, 3%, 5.65%. Uh, what you said about us growing faster than during colonial times is absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. In fact, it can be safely said that even in its period when it was growing relatively slowly, it was growing many times faster. Even when it was the slowest rate of growth, nearly 1.5, it was still growing three times faster than it was growing in the fastest period in the, of, of colonialism. So that once again shows you that we might be more pessimistic about the future, but the data, at least as far as economic growth is concerned, indicates the opposite. How did the British uh, emerge at the top? This section is based on an article, on this article and other points of data, by Aditya Mukherjee uh, in the Economic and Political Weekly. Let's see what he has to say. He says, well, uh, first of all, Britain made its source of income from the Atlantic slave trade in the 18th century. Britain paid for slaves with Indian goods and paid India with treasure from Latin America. Uh, British ships carried something to the tune of 3.4 million or more enslaved Africans to the American continent. Three and a half million. Four million pounds came into Britain from its West Indian plantations, Jamaica, et cetera, et cetera, compared with one million from the rest of the world. So they made a huge amount of money, 
not just by transporting slaves to the American continent, but from the plantation colonies that they set up in the United States of America. Imports for India, from India were financed in turn by silver and gold from the rape of Latin America. So you know the, the Aztec gold, how they picked up all of this massive Inca and Aztec gold. They use that to basically buy things from India and then sell them to Africa. Indian textiles accounted for about 27% of all goods shipped from England to Africa during the 18th century. So there's a triangle now created by the, by the British where they are able to exploit Africa, India, Latin America, and you'll see also China just a bit. After the conquest of Bengal, it's, it's something that we don't really talk about when we talk about the so-called Industrial Revolution. We don't mention the fact that the Industrial Revolution takes off immediately following the conquest of Bengal. In 1803, the East India Company, this is a company, a multinational company, had 260,000 soldiers its own soldiers, its own private army. Imagine if Coca-Cola has an army of Dhailag Lok. That was the situation back then. When we say multinational companies have come into the world today, it's not true. Initially, colonialism was only based on multinational companies. It, either the Dutch East India Company or the French East India Company or the British East India Company, these were the companies that dominated the third world. It was not the governments, it was the companies that first came into India. And here are the revenues. Uh, the revenue of the army was, oh sorry, so the, 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 the army that uh, the East India Company had in, in India was twice the size of the army that the government of Britain had in Britain itself. This was the largest army at their disposal. And the revenues were about 13 million dollars as you can see, expenses were about 14 million dollars. So as you can see from those figures, pounds sorry, not dollars, pounds. As you can see from those figures, uh, armies have pretty much in India always been run at a bit of a loss made up by from taxpayers in other places, etc. So right after the conquest of Bengal in 1757, in 17, between 1764 and 1785, we see a number of new things not just emerge, but uh, that are new machines that are then used for the production of cotton and other things. The spinning jenny, the water frame, the Crompton mule, uh, power looms, etc. The flying shuttle, uh, coal replacing wood in smelting. Uh, James Watt creates the steam invention, a steam engine. All of these things immediately follow the conquest of Bengal. And the money used from Bengal, uh, sorry, the money extracted from Bengal is used then to set up these new industries in England that play the role in the industrial takeoff of England. By the way, the what we call the Industrial Revolution had a growth rate of, what do you think what the growth rate was of the Industrial Revolution in England? At its peak, yes. The growth rate was only 1%. Yet we call it an Industrial Revolution because mankind had not seen till that date even a 1% per annum rate of growth. So it was a revolution compared to what was going on there. Today in Pakistan, when we fail to hit 3%, we say the government should be replaced. Yet, that is three times faster than the Industrial Revolution, but we don't think that Pakistan is undergoing a revolution, even though, in a certain sense, it is. While the British were extracting all this money from Bengal, they also caused the death of up to 10 million people by exacerbating the Bengal famine. Of course, the famine was already there, but because they were extracting so much from the peasants, the peasants were unable to recover fast enough to, 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 you know, to manage their lives. And so 10 million people died in that. Warren Hastings reported in 1772 that a third of the population in the affected regions starved to death. Amartya Sen, who's a Nobel Prize winner, said that the, that the famine was basically a man-made famine. No previous famine had occurred in Bengal in that century. And yet this famine was so terrible that it claimed the lives of 10 million people. That's how terrible it was. Now generally people are agreed that the first phase of, phase of colonialism was pretty terrible and brutal. But they say, well, in the second phase of colonialism, things got better. But is that really the case? Irfan Habib gives us the statistics, the, the, the data, that between 1801, sorry, in 1801, 
the drain on the Indian economy represented something to the tune of 9% of the GNP of India. So 9% was taken out of India into England. About 30% of domestic savings uh, available for capital formations in Britain was supplied by what was extracted from India. Similarly, Utsap Patnaik says that rain from Asia and West Indies together was about 84.06% of British capital formation. That's massive. That is the extremely important role that colonialism plays in the takeoff <coughs> of Britain and the West in general. And if you're wondering what this is, this is a picture of an opium factory. A factory that was, there were several factories that were set up in India uh, that were making opium and selling them to China. So this is, uh, these are Indian workers uh, basically producing opium. And the British produced opium in India and then they would sell it to China. And when the Chinese resisted uh, the importation of opium, the British went to war with them four times in the name of free trade to sell drugs into China. Um, so meanwhile, uh, you know, they started by se selling cotton, but the Chinese also make pretty good, you know, cloth, cotton, silk, etc., etc. So they traded that for producing opium, and from China they would they would get tea and also silk. In 1855, Indian export of opium to China was worth 6.23 million pounds, uh, and this paid for all the tea and silk, which was worth about 8.5 million that Britain took from China. So, and of course, I told you, they went to war four times. The profits made by the East India Company from colonialism in India was so massive that uh, 1880, 1889, India financed more than 40% of Britain's balance of payment deficits. So, it could, it's good to have a colony, right? Uh, we have a balance of payment problem right now in Pakistan. We have to go to Saudi Arabia, China, the International Monetary Fund to make up for it. If we had a nice colony, like the British had India, you know, they could pay for half of our problems right there and then. Uh, this, uh, between 1871 and 1860, the surplus calculated after applying a compound interest rate of 4% amounted to a conservative estimate of about 3.2 billion pounds is what they're able to make from that money that they get when you apply compound interest rate to it. <coughs> also, they applied a monopoly on India. So, by 1887, Britain had captured about 66% of the Indian domestic market. By 1900, India was absorbing more than 86% of British textiles. And other people could not trade with India, France or whatever. India could not go to non-British people to trade because there was this monopoly applied by the British colonial government. Then in 1834, when slavery was abolished in uh, England and other parts of Europe, there was a huge abolitionist movement for the abolition of slavery. And there was a labor co a shortage caused by the abolition of slavery. What did the British do? They took millions of Indian laborers and moved them to other colonies where they needed to construct things. So plantations, roads, railways, infrastructure in the Caribbean, in Mauritius, in Fiji, in South Africa, in Malaya, in Sri Lanka, in Burma, etc. All of this was built with Indian labor that was taken from India, moved to other countries where they would build railroads and other things. And that's why 65% uh, of the population in Mauritius, even today, is Indian. 42% in British Guyana, 34% in Trinidad, 43% in Fiji. There are lots of Indians settled all over the world because the British moved them there. And in fact, after World War II, lots of Indian laborers moved also to Manchester and Birmingham and north of England, where they basically managed the cotton textile mills, etc. Overall, more than 2 million indentured laborers were exported just between 1831 and 1920. And the trend, though, continues, except we don't call it, it's not indentured labor anymore. But now, you know, the labor continues to move to wherever it is needed, uh, you know, all over the globe to service capital and to service the empire. In the last period, World War, in, during World War I, Britain became heavily indebted to the U.S., uh, home charges increased from 2 million pounds to, what is it, 32 million pounds. Military expenditures doubled from 5 million pounds to 10 million pounds. Interest charges on external public debt increased from 6 million to 14.3 million, etc., etc. 
Who paid for it? How did that work out? We paid for it. In 1970, we, India supplied goods worth 100 million pounds without any payment, free goods. Here it is, you know, for you to go ahead and conquer the world. We give you all this money. In 1918, it made another gift of 45 million pounds to the British war effort, World War I, so that the British Empire would become stronger. And the pictures that you're seeing are soldiers from India that were fighting the wars for the British. Similarly, in World War II, defense expenditures increased nine times. Uh, they went from rupees 50 crore to 458 crore. Uh, defense services uh, were about 55%. In 1920, they went up to 75% by the end of World War uh, II. And uh, 60, in 1930, 60% of the Indian government's budget went to the military, to the British India military. About 60 million out of 100 million pounds was absorbed by military expenditures, etc., etc. And then there was the export of treasure, gold, silver, other beautiful things that were given to Britain. Between 1932, uh, 31, 32, and 38-39, 55% of the total visible positive balance of trade was met through the net export of treasure. So you go to England today, in private collections as well as in public museums, you will see tons and tons of uh, uh, Indian treasure. O over here, what's this jewel over here that we see? That's the Kohenur, right? The most, one of the most famous diamonds in the world. So gold uh, exports constituted about 95% of the total visible positive balance of trade. And we also gave loans. Can you believe that India was giving loans to the, to the British? We thought it'd be the other way around, but it's, this is what was called. In fact, this was called the sterling balance. And um, while three million Indians were dying from starvation, India was giving a loan to the, Uni to the United Kingdom uh, so that the UK could pay for its war effort, etc. So to conclude, the net drain, Irfan Habib uh, uh, does the, does the, the, the math or, or puts together the, the, the data, that the net drain that we look at, that we're looking at over this period of approximately two centuries, is that every year India was losing between five to ten percent of her GDP, sorry about the typo, of her GDP to the United Kingdom. For two hundred years, five to ten percent of whatever it is that Indians are producing is moving out of the country. You do that for two hundred years, yeah, it's going to cause problems. I move next to the article by Ishrat uh, Hussain. This article is called The Role of Politics in Pakistan's Economy. Now, Dr. Ishrat Hussain has been a very influential figure in, uh, uh, in, Pakistan, in, in, in the writing with, on economic issues with respect to Pakistan. He was in the World Bank for about 20 odd years, as you can see, um, and he headed, I think, Central Asia. Uh, while he was uh, for a number of years at the World Bank. He was, he also served as the dean of your uh, competitive institution, that's IBA in Karachi, right? There's LUMS or there's IBA. Um, and he was governor of State Bank of Pakistan between 99 and 2006. And he is presently also serving as an advisor to Imran Khan. He's been very, very influential at the top level of governance. So we read what he has to say about what's going on with respect to Pakistan. What we inherited, you saw some of what we inherited, and how did we transform it? How did we change it? What did we do with it? Now please note that this is what one would call the mainstream view. There are many different views, obviously, critical as well as uh, uh, you know, setting the agenda, agenda setting views. This is what you would call the mainstream view of the political economy of Pakistan. How have we developed? What has been our, the story of our development? What's been going on? So the first thing that Dr. Ishrat says is that, well, he says, you know, we've been growing at about 5% since 1947. The paper, I think, was written in 2009. We've been growing at an average rate of 5%. Zaidi says the same thing. He says we've been growing at an average rate of 5.2%. And this is a pretty, pretty good rate of growth. If you look at it from the point of view of the long view of history, then it's actually really, really good, right? 
Uh, yet Pakistan has religious extremism, fundamentalism, sectarianism, ethnic cleavages, regional disp disparities, and a lot of political instability. Right? We don't really have stable governments. We have governments that come and go quite quickly. So the real sort of irony is how can a country that is so politically unstable still give, uh, you know, still achieve such high rates of economic growth? Um, and the other major question that he asks, and I think it's a very interesting one, is what accounts for the disparity between India and Pakistan? India, India was able to develop these sort of stable democracies. They've become a bit un, it's become a bit unstable recently. But nonetheless, pretty stable democracy, no military rule ever, no rule by the civil military bureaucracy. They always have elections, some party wins, they do good things or bad things, but that's the way power is managed in India. Whereas in Pakistan, we've had military rule for so many years, for decades, in fact. Um, and has the Pakistani economy grown faster under military rule? So maybe military rule is not so bad if the economy is growing faster. So this is one of the ways in which nearly all the people who are writing on political economy tend to divide the history of Pakistan, even if they're talking about economic issues. So they, you know, sort of take a chunk of the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, the Musharraf <coughs> period, etc. The problem with this periodization in the economic history of Pakistan is that really the periods reflect certain uh, political institutions, the rise and fall of certain political institutions. So in October 1958, you know that General Ayub takes power. He stays in power for the decade of the 1960s. Then there's uh, the breakup of the country, etc. Finally, the establishment of the first uh, sort of popularly elected democratic government. Uh, the government falls in 1977. You get Ziaul Haq. So that's the end of Zia, etc. So this distinction is really a very political one not so much an economic one. Yet, it's the one that nearly all economists also tend to use. We have the periodization. We haven't really made a periodization in accordance with the economic history of Pakistan. The, the economic periodization pretty much matches with the political periodization. Uh, but some of the policies actually continue. So you were saying that Pakistan has seen many, many prime ministers, and this lasts for a very, very short time. That's true. Dr. Ishrat Hussain points out that Pakistan has seen 23 governments in the past 60 years, 14 elected prime ministers, uh, elected or appointed prime ministers, five interim governments, and 33 years of military rule under four different leaders. So you see that when you have 33 years under four leaders, and you have the rest of the years under 25 odd leaders, that shows you the relative stability of military rule versus the relative instability of uh, democratic rule. So the average lifespan of any given government is less than two years. Um, in fact, uh, if you exclude uh, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto's term, it comes down all the way to 1.6%. He was uh, one of the rare politicians who managed to complete his term, and there's a few others here and there. But otherwise, prime ministers in Pakistan take any job in this country, don't try to, don't try to take the prime minister's job. It's the most untenured, <laughs> difficult job to take. So, what does he say about the 50s? He calls them the flat 50s, by which of course he means okay, there, isn't, there isn't really much growth. Um, one of the key things that happens in the 1950s is a 1954 election, the provincial election in East Pakistan, where the Muslim League Please note, which is the party that creates Pakistan, makes Pakistan independent, loses the provincial election. This comes as a huge shock to the Muslim League leadership uh, and also to most people in West Pakistan. How could the party that makes you independent lose the election so soon after becoming independent? The Congress party more or less stays in power in India for decades after uh, after independence. But here the situation is very different. So immediately following this uh, uh, loss, uh, this, this uh, defeat in elections, they uh, take this, the provinces of West Pakistan and they merge all the provinces together, creating what's called the one unit. And, uh, uh, and what that is, does is it creates the parity formula with, uh, between East and West Pakistan that they would have equal representation, even though East Pakistan has 55% of the population. The growth rate is 
which is pretty much what India was also achieving at that time. Um, and it's significantly faster than anything achieved under colonial rule, but uh, to, by today's standards would be considered rather sluggish. Then comes Ayub Khan, takes power in 1958. I think you know much of this stuff, right? You're all junior, so you must have studied you know, all this stuff, but it's important to review it nonetheless uh, for those people who might not know. So Ayub Khan takes power in October 1958. He gets a lot of Harvard advisors. You must have heard of Samuel Huntington, who talks about clash of civilizations. Well, he was one of the key uh, advisors to the Pakistani government at the time. Also, Gustav Papanik, who's very, very well known, etc., internationally. He was one of the key advisors. The Planning Commission on Economic Management and Reforms is set up, the Planning Commission for short, and it undertakes the industrial planning of Pakistan. GDP growth rates now go above 6%. They become very high. Agriculture is also growing 3%, 4%, etc. In this article, Dr. Ishrat Hussain gives very roundabout figures, and he doesn't even cite them, which is a bit sloppy in my opinion. But uh, you can see these statistics in their exactness by the FBR. Yes. Manufacturing grew at 9%, agriculture 3-4%. By 1969, Pakistan's manufacturing exports were higher than the exports of Thailand, Malaysia, and Indonesia combined, he says, although he hasn't given any figures for that. But 22 families come to control the industrial wealth of Pakistan. There's a widespread uh, inequality between East and West Pakistan. Uh, Ayub Khan sets up the system of basic democracies, but it fails to garner the kind of legitimacy that he hopes for. Mujib, meanwhile, M Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, meanwhile, becomes a hero in East Pakistan after the Agratullah case. Uh, and if you are interested to know a little more, it was my grandfather who was the Chief Justice uh, in this case against Sheikh Mujib. Of course, the case didn't complete, so therefore, uh, he never gave a judgment, etc. But the files are sitting with my dad. Um, soon after that, we get Yahya, we get a military operation against East Pakistan, and we get the major factor which brings us into the 1970s, the breakup of Pakistan, the election of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto in West Pakistan. He sets about immediately nationalizing industries, nationalizing banks, insurance companies, educational institutes, institutions. FC College and many other private institutions are taken over by the government. Uh, Ishad Hussain says growth rate declines to 3.7. Inflation is also very high at 16%. He concedes that there were many difficulties in the Bhutto period that were not of Bhutto's making, such as, for example, floods that occurred in the early 1970s, OPEC, which caused the oil prices to rise dramatically, causing Pakistan to have a big deficit, and other, and the breakup of East Pakistan, of course, being the biggest one. Uh, Large-scale manufacturing also, he says, totters us along at 3%. Uh, he says it was good populist politics. It was very, very popular, but it was very bad for the economy. What happens in the 1980s? Ziaul Haq take, takes power. He bans political uh, activity. Uh, he, he's, uh, Pakistan is strongly allied with the United States against the Soviet Union, which has invaded Afghanistan, the United States, Saudi Arabia, and the West generally gives Pakistan copious amounts of assistance, and the economic growth rate of Pakistan now goes all the way up to 6.6%. Fiscal deficit, though, also widens to 8%. Um, and at the end of the decade, Pakistan has to once again apply for uh, assistance from the International Monetary Fund. So high rates of growth, but this is also the time when we get the Klashnikov culture, smuggling, jihad, madrasas, sharia courts, Islamic educational curriculum, and the growth and development of Islamic extremism in Pakistan. In the 1990s, in this period, you get uh, the formation of nine different governments. You not only get the four elected governments, Benazir comes to power twice, Nawaz Sharif comes to power twice. And by the way, the very interesting thing about this period is that both Nawaz Sharif and Benazir are extremely, extremely young politicians. They're both in their 30s. You know, so we keep talking about youth empowerment. This was the best period for Pakistani youth empowerment. Now, this is the period after the breakup of the Soviet Union. So the world is now saying, uh, nationalization and socialist planning doesn't work. We've got to privatize, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We've got to deregulate. We've got to privatize. We've got to liberalize. And all the four governments that, uh, sorry, all the nine different governments that come into place follow pretty much the model that the IMF gives them. Uh, the result is that this is not a very good period for Pakistan's growth rate. GDP is at 4%. Investment ratio is only at 13.9%. There's a fisc growing fiscal deficit, trade deficit, external debt goes from 20 
billion dollars all the way up to 47 billion uh, sorry all the way up to 43 billion dollars it climbs all the way up to half of the gdp of the country it's even higher now Poverty goes from 18 to 34 percent. There's instability, misgovernance, lack of political will, lots of exogenous shocks. Nuclear testing causes capital fright. It's not a very good period for Pakistan's economy, according to Dr. Ishrat Hussain. So, democracy, Saad, your favorite. Doesn't really do the trick, according to Dr. Ishrat Hussain. Then comes uh, the period of Musharraf. He says this is a better period. We get the, this is the, a reforming period. Finally, we seem to be back on track. Uh, GDP growth rates is seven percent. Poverty reduction between five and ten percent, depending on what methodology you use. Debt to GDP ratio falls to fifty-five percent from one hundred percent. Fiscal deficit uh, is only four percent of GDP, very manageable. Investment raise grows to 23% of GDP, $14 billion we get in foreign private capital investments. But yes, the assassination of Benazir once again causes tremendous instability in Pakistan. Finally, he says, well, you know, there's lots of people who criticize the military uh, and so on. And what are their criticisms? Jeff, Christopher Jeffrelaw, for example, says that uh, the idea that you can create a nation out of religion is not really working in the context of Pakistan because Pakistan is far too ethnically diverse. Um, others say that the alignment with the United States, CETO after CETO and CENTO, as you pointed out, is the main reason for the growth in the economy. And this is a very unsustainable model of growth. Um, uh, still other people's, people criticize the Harvard Advisory Group, et cetera, and PIDE. Uh, that has a very peculiar model of development, etc. Stephen Cohen says, again, that aid from the US, China, and Saudi Arabia is the main reason for the growth rate during military, the periods of military intervention. Although Ishat Hussain contradicts that by saying, well, you've got 5.8% of GDP, Bhutto got 10.5% of aid in terms of GDP. So Bhutto got more international aid, according to him, and yet Bhutto's growth rate was lower. But Vez Hassan similarly says, well, even we really got to reduce um, military spending by at least 2% and use that money in development expenditures, etc. Hossein Haqqani similarly says that external aid has the impact in Pakistan's politics that it makes the military believe overestimate its own strength and it makes it, makes it, it encourages it into a confrontationist position vis-a-vis -vis India and we can't de-escalate from that situation uh, as a result of the military aid that we get. So. Dr. Ishrat Hussain also agrees with some of this criticism, although making his points in the middle, and concludes by saying that he concludes by arguing that while military dictatorships have had faster rates of growth, the political instability caused by military rule is much too high a price to pay uh, for that increased economic growth. The interruptions caused to the democratic process have created more problems than solutions. He concludes at the end. Let's look at uh, Akbar Zaidi. Akbar Zaidi has written this uh, in what I consider to be an extremely good book called Issues in Pakistan's Economy. I think it's a very good book because um, it's a very good source for data, for empirical data, where he has made an effort not only to cite all the original data from the government of Pakistan, Pakistan's Economic Survey, or Federal Bureau of Statistics, or whatever. He has also tried his best to sum up the data, to present us good summaries of the data. And last but certainly not least, he has given us um, summaries of each of the readings as well as uh, places where we can go to for further reading on that particular subject. So I think this is a really quite, a, I, I think this is quite a wonderful book for that reason. It remains very light on theory and very heavy on the data itself, which makes for a very good book because then you can use the data and come to your own conclusions. Uh, I highly recommend that if you're going to be looking, if you're going to be doing CSS or you're going to be doing, uh, you know, anything with respect to Pakistan's economy, uh, that you purchase this book and uh, keep it in your library, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, it's difficult to find so much data in one volume, uh, you know, in in the other publications that I've seen. So it's quite good. So Zaidi Saab is a, a visiting professor at Columbia University. He also holds other positions at the Department of Middle East and South Asian and African Studies, etc. And he's been writing on uh, Pakistan's economy for a number of years, for many, many decades now. Um, and you can see that he's writing from a relatively speaking more critical or left perspective. 
So what does he have to say? Well, he begins by saying that it's very important not just to look at a snapshot of what's going on in Pakistan <coughs> or where we're at in terms of the data, but it's also important to see what is the story of development. How did all of this unfold? How did we come to this conclusion? How did we come to that conclusion? Um, so while it is true that we've had a threefold increase in per capita income for over the last six decades, that's quite major. And he's, he also says that literacy has increased threefolds in the same period. We nonetheless have to see, we have to break this data down to see what's really going on. The reason why I bought Steven Pinker in the beginning was to, to show you that while you may be very pessimistic about Pakistan, the data is less pessimistic. In fact, what we've sometimes, a lot of times what we fail to notice is, you know, things change. Our perception of whether we should be optimistic or negative about Pakistan or about any country or your own country is driven mainly by the news, by what we read on social media and what we read on a daily basis. So if, um, you know, a nine-year-old gets raped and murdered, that immediately creates in us a strongly negative opinion about what's going on in our country. And not undeservedly so. We should feel strongly that something is not right in our country where children, where such things happen to children, right? But what that picture sometimes does not show are the larger macroeconomic structural changes that are occurring uh, in Pakistan. And that the data can sometimes reveal, and that's very, very interesting. So let's start by looking at what the data points out. Well, over here we have, we begin with population. This is 1951, this is 2004 and 2014. Data from these different points. So let's compare. The population of Pakistan was only 34, less than 34 million when we began. Very, very small compared to today. And today we are estimating that it is, well, it says 185 in 2014, but today we estimate that it is over 200 million people live in this country, making Pakistan one of the largest countries in the world. In fact, I think it's the sixth largest, the seventh largest country in the world, with the fifth largest military or something like that. I forget the exact number. But we feel like a very small country. We feel like a small country because we're surrounded by three of the largest countries in the world, India, China, and Russia, the former Soviet Union. So we feel like a small country, but we're not. We're actually a very large country. What's happening with urbanization? You'll be shocked to discover that, in fact, Pakistan has been rapidly urbanizing. It's gone from less than 18% urban. That means you know, more than 80% of people lived in villages when we became independent, to now 60 to 70% urban. South, in South Asia, it is, in fact, one of the most urbanized societies. We are more urbanized than India is. We are much more urbanized than other South Asian countries. This, is, this also comes as a bit of a shock or surprise sometimes, at least it get, did to me, because I always imagine India is much more industrialized than Pakistan or something of that sort, but that's not correct. What's going on with agriculture, if you look at it in terms of uh, uh, contribution to GDP, we see that when we became independent, agriculture contributed over half of all of uh, gross domestic production. And this has now slipped down to only about 21, in fact, 20%. So agriculture today, which contributed more than half, contributes less than one-fifth, or about one-fifth, to the uh, economy of Pakistan. And what's taken its place? Well, first of all, manufacturing. That's gone from 7.8 all the way up to, uh, to uh, one-fifth. It was up to a quarter even before. But you can see things have not been going so well since then. Um, and services that have gone, that have ballooned to nearly 58% over here. Services is a huge section of the economy, the largest, the one that absorbs most people as well. Um, so, and in, but in terms of labor force, we can see that while, you know, 65% of Pakistan's labor force was in agriculture, which produced 53% of its output, today, 45% produces 20%. So what does that mean? It means that the shift out of, in terms of GDP, agriculture is much less important than it was before. But in terms of employment, it continues to employ 
uh, over 40% of the people of Pakistan. Sometimes this is 44%, sometimes a little less, sometimes a little more. Similarly, manufacturing has gone from 9% all the way up to 18%, back down to 13%, which is still pretty high. Now, keep in mind that statistics with respect to manufacturing are not employment statistics with respect to manufacturing, in my experience, are not always accurate. Uh, they always underestimate the number of people employed in factories. And the reason is that uh, people who want to evade taxes will say they have 100 workers employed, whereas in reality they may have 200 workers employed. Uh, and they shift the other workers to, you know, they outsource that. They, they say, no, no, these are not really sort of regular employees of the firm. They are not permanent employees of the firm. They're just doing some odd job, etc. And hence that's why they're there. So they're not counted in the, uh, sometimes they can be miscounted because um, factories themselves do not always give very accurate numbers of the number of people employed because they want to evade taxes. So this could actually be uh, higher than it, it, it seems here. About the same number of people as agriculture is absorbed by services and trade, etc., etc. Um, what's happening with GNP per capita in US terms? It goes from 170 to 440 to 1368. It's a little higher now. I think it's uh, 14, 1500 now. Now, one of the key things to understand about GDP per capita or GNP per capita is that it significantly underestimates the standard of living of people in, part, in that country. And the reason is that since the dollar is considered to be over, is, uh, you know, uh, is, is a strong currency, it's a lot of times over-appreciated in comparison to the rupee. What you can buy with the rupee is actually a lot more than would, we, would, we would estimate by the dollar price. So you sometimes have to make the translation from GNP GDP per capita to GNP per GDP per capita in terms of purchasing power parity. That's very, very important to do that. And when you do that, you discover that actually Pakistanis are not as worse off as it seems. They're at least twice as better off. OK, to continue, what's happening with exports? You can see that 99% of our exports were in primary commodities. That has undergone a dramatic transformation. And now you see that's, uh, that, in fact, uh, things that are manufactures are approximately 70% of our exports. So the more you move from primary commodities to semi-manufacturers to manufactured commodities, the more it, see, it means that technologically you're advancing and you're not just exporting Gundam in its raw form or cotton in its raw form, but you're processing it. But it still needs to be stated that while this has now gone all the way up to 70% and even higher, most of it is one step, only one step removed from agriculture. Most of it is still just one, just one step of processes, processing from agriculture. It's not really high technology stuff. You're not making computers or other things, etc. What's happening with primary schools? We had 8,500, nearly 8,400 primary schools. That has ballooned to, to 153,000 primary schools. That's fantastic. But it's probably not fantastic enough right, compared to the population, we might argue, right, okay. We, it should have been much more. Literacy similarly has gone, similarly has gone from 15% all the way up to 58%. But this is a relatively low level of literacy. Can you write your name? Can you read an akhbar ki surkhi? Can you read the headline? Gender disparity. Oh, sorry, 12% literacy for women, 15% overall literacy. That means male literacy is actually higher than 15 in order to average at 15%. What happens to that here? 58 to 47 percent. So male literacy tends to be, has to be much higher than 60 percent in order for the average to be 58 percent if female literacy is 47 percent. So we continue to have gender disparity as far as education is concerned. No surprise there, I think. All right, what's happened with life expectancy? Oh my God, I would have been dead had I, if I was an average Pakistani in 1947, I would have been dead by now. I just gave away my age. But it's gone up to uh, almost 66 years. Infant mortality has gone from 134 to 59. Access to safe water has gone from 29% to 92%. That's something to be positive about. Access to sanitation has gone from 14% all the way up to nearly half the people of the country. 
Here, interesting thing, the number of doctors has gone from 1,000 to 160,000. That's quite something in the last 60 years, 70 years. Whereas the number of doctors per patient, for every doctor you had 14,000 patients back when we became independent. Today you have, per doctor, 1,100 patients. Now you might argue that the quality of doctors has gone down, sir. Look at what's going on with YPA. That's a separate debate. But, uh, but the numbers certainly give us room for cautious optimism. It's always nice to be able to put these numbers in a graph because it helps to see it with greater clarity what's going on. So here you see this is the contribution of GDP to agriculture. It goes all the way down to that small size over here. All right, that's a structural transformation in the economy. We keep thinking about this in terms of, well, India has done so much better, South Korea has done so much better, Taiwan has done so much better. That may be true, but that ought not to be the only thing we're looking at. Because we also want to try and understand what's happening inside Pakistan to Pakistanis, their culture, their understanding, their, the way they connect and to, uh, relate to each other as a consequence of these structural, massive, huge structural changes. In terms of labor force, you see a huge number of laborers, about 65% employed in agriculture, comes down to about 44%. Still pretty high, but not as high as it used to be. And the most dramatic transformation, of course, is in terms of exports, which were 98% primary commodities, and are now you know, reversed with 60% being uh, other manufacturers. Here's another very interesting chart um, that looks at growth rates. So what it shows is decade-wise GDP, agriculture, manufacturing, commodity producing sector, and service sector, what are the growth rates? So 1960s, which uh, Isha Tushan calls the decade of development, the golden decade, 6.77% rate of growth on average. That's not bad. It's pretty good. 1970s, he gives a different statistic from Ishrat Hussain. And this is, is the source is Government of Pakistan, Pakistan's Economic Survey. Whereas you recall, Ishrat Hussain gave the statistic of 3% in the Bhutto period. What's his name? Zaidi gives the statistic of 4.84%, nearly 5%. 80s, 6.5%. So we see a repeat of this growth. 1996, 4.6%, we see a repeat of this growth pattern here. Uh, further than that, 3.29, then we see the Musharraf period, 6.8%, right? And um, after that, 2.7%, 4.7%, 3.6%, 2. Point something percent, right? So that's the overall GDP trends decade-wise. Agriculture, let's look at that quickly. 5 to 2, 5, 4, 1.5, 4, 2, 3, 3. So you see that you get very high rates of growth here, here. And what's going on in these high rates of growth is essentially the introduction, the big scale introduction of green revolution technology. Other than that, you can, you can see that these are sort of some outliers here, etc. Other than that, you see a pretty steady 2, 3% rate of growth. Manufacturing. Now, manufacturing typically is very difficult to get a high, you know, uh, to get uh, big output out of agriculture. It's actually very difficult to make agriculture grow very quickly. But it's easier to make manufacturing grow by very large numbers very quickly with the proper uh, policies, investment, etc. 9.93% Ayub Khan. 5.5% Bhutto, which is again different from the number he gave. But we're looking at the entire 70s here, so that's a bit of a tricky thing as well. 8.2% Zia, 4.8% uh, in uh, the 90s, uh, Benazir and uh, Nawaz, etc. 4.8, 9.6, 0.45, God, 7.1, 3.5. Generally, the, the way manufacturing grew in the 60s, 70s, 80s, it's no, it no longer seems to be growing, especially heavy manufacturing. Uh, commodity producing sector, 6.8, 3, 6, 4, 2, 5, 2, 4, and 3. And finally, the service sector, uh, 6, 6, 6, 4, 4, 6, 3, 5, 3. Everything seems to be going down over here. I think you're absolutely right insofar as 
uh, pointing out that these aggregate statistics can be very, very misleading. Yet they are presented all the time in political discussions, debates, policy choices. We present these massive aggregate statistics. In the 70s, we did this. In the 80s, we did that. Hence, we should do what we did in the 80s without looking at exogenous factors like what's happening to oil prices, where is the world market going, what's happening with flooding, what was it that caused this particular growth spurt in the 1980s? Can we reproduce those policies today? Do we have the same kind of external uh, assistance and aid that we had previously, etc., etc.? I think that if uh, you sort of jumped ahead to where, where I was going to conclude, which is that sometimes these aggregate statistics can be very, very uh, misleading. But they are still very important. It's still very important to know what they are, but it's, it would not be right to draw certain aggregate conclusions from them without getting into the nitty gritty of what caused that particular trend. What's the situation with respect to human development? Well, according to Zaidi, he says from the uh, data that he has, which is sadly a little old, uh, from where we are standing about 10 years old, 44% literate adults, 60% literate female uh, adults, illiterate, sorry, female adults, 44% illiterate adults. Uh, population before, below the poverty line is 22.3%. Uh, below the $1.25 a day line is 21%. That's basically one-fifth of Pakistan's population, more than one-fifth of Pakistan's population below the poverty line. 8% without access to clean water, 52% still half the country without access to sanitation, 31% under five uh, malnourished children. We can think of this in negative terms and say Pakistan isn't doing too well, or we can think of this in terms of challenges. So Zedi points out some of the huge transformations, and these, are, these can cause complications in the data, is firstly, we don't have East Pakistan anymore. All the data has to be disaggregated uh, in order to understand West Pakistan trends, East Pakistan trends, because we did a, a lot of our development came as a result of the fact this is the majority of the country. Jute and tea were produced in East Pakistan. They were sold. The foreign exchange that we earned from it went to fuel industrialization. The East Pakistani said that most of this foreign exchange went to fuel industrialization in West Pakistan. They were very unhappy about the fact that they were doing the primary production and West Pakistanis were reaping the benefit. And they called this a sort of internal colonialism between East and West Pakistan. Of course, there's a massive loss of the consumer and labor market. So the biggest transformation in Pakistan, and we forget this all the time. When we talk about structural transformation, we forget the majority of the country is no longer with Pakistan. So any data that we look at, we have to be very aware of the, of the fact that we have to disaggregate. The other major huge transformation, which we already mentioned it, is urbanization. Um, so I think we've already looked at the numbers. We don't need to look at them again. More than 65% of Pakistan's labor force worked in agriculture. Today, it's uh, much less. 21% of GDP only comes from agriculture. We looked at that. 45% 45, 45 of labor is in, employed in agriculture. It used to be 17%, blah, blah, blah. We looked at these numbers. The degree of urbanization is great, but I wanted to point this out. In 2015, the number of people living in what we consider to be urban areas is approximately 60%. And in Punjab, it is even higher at 70%. So Punjab is one of the most urbanized provinces. We think of Punjab, we think of the Punjabi peasant, you know, doing Bhangra, etc. But most of Punjab is now living in small cities, towns, and even big cities, etc. Very big transformation. Right, so urbanization is a massive, massive shift. Um, and I think I, I take your point. I think both your points are very, very important. Um, I would like to point out, though, that uh, major jumps in, tech, uh, in, in productivity occur through the introduction of uh, new technology. That's the bottom line. Right, so major jumps in agricultural productivity are only going to occur when you get massive influxes of things like harvester combines, tractorization, tube wells, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, agricultural technology. Okay, the other argument that uh, Zedi wants to take up is the question of feudalism. We often ascribe a lot of our social problems and political problems to feudalism, uh, honor killings, for example. Uh, patriarchy in culture, for, uh, for example, and many other things to the persistence of feudalism. Zaidi makes an argument that this is a myth. Uh, Pakistan is no longer a feudal society. Uh, 
Pakistan is basically a capitalist country. It's not a feudal country anymore. How many of you think that can't be right? Pakistan is mainly feudal. Raise your hands. Nobody, because I said already what Zaidi thinks. So now you're afraid to go against him. But uh, an interesting argument, right? Um, he says, tractorization, mechanization, tube wells, HYV seeds as high yield variety seeds, pesticides, that's the green revolution technology package, have transformed Pakistani agriculture. While there may be pockets of, of feudalism in remote areas, mainly Pakistan is now a capitalist country. And agriculture in Pakistan is basically occurring according to capitalist lines. We are still dealing with many of the legacies of colonialism. This is where I began my talk. I asked you whether we were better off under colonialism. Most of you said no. What are those legacies? We have a highly import and aid dependent economy. I think this, we, I don't need to prove to you. Uh, Mr. Tabdili Sarkar has proved it. Uh, because I really believe that Imran Khan and Asad Omar and others were, were genuinely, genuinely believed that they could do without aid and that they, could, they didn't have to go to the International Monetary Fund. But the economic situation is, is, is structured in such a way that they had no choice but to do what they did. Well, they had other choices that they could have made, but there'd be costs to pay with respect to that. Um, we are the 39th poorest nation out of 203 classified by the World Bank using GNP per capita. Uh, that's not a very good thing. I think we should be higher up on that list. Not because we ought to be higher up on that list, but because we need to do more for, you know, to pull ourselves out of that list. But we are very high up on the list of uh, countries that are perceived to be corrupt. So, you know, uh, the corruption perception index tells us that we are, you know, we consider ourselves to be the second most corrupt country in the world. That doesn't mean, by the way, that we are the second most corrupt country in the world. It's that we think that we are the most one of the most corrupt countries in the world. Uh, this is true, and uh, we, we can sh uh, evidence can be shown that uh, depending on how corruption is framed by the mainstream media and political parties, the perception of corruption can alter dramatically, very, very quickly. So there may be countries in the world that are way more corrupt than we are, but uh, the perception doesn't exist that they are as corrupt. But we think very negatively about ourselves. Everybody's corrupt, we think. Um, this lovely statistic I've already shared with you, but you also shared the idea that the quality of education shows a definite downward shift. So let's not be too happy. All in all, he says, Zedi says, we have a cr crude, corrupt, rent-seeking, clientele-based form of capitalism, and that is the principal legacy of colonialism and what we have to deal with in Pakistan. That brings my presentation to an end.